Tom Swift and His Airship by Victor Appleton, Chapter 19 Wrecked With her nose headed north, the red cloud swung along through the air. Those on board were thinking of many things, but chief among them was the unjust accusation that had been made against them by an irresponsible boy, the red-haired Andy Fulger. They read the account in the paper again, seeking to learn from it new things at each perusal. "'It's just a lot of circumstantial evidence, that's what it is,' said Tom. "'I admit it might look suspicious to anyone who didn't know us, but Andy Fulger has certainly done the most mischief by his conclusions. Burglar tools, the idea.' "'I think I shall sue the bank for damages,' declared Mr. Damon. "'They've injured my reputation by making this accusation against me, anyhow.' I'll certainly never do any more business with them, and I'll withdraw my $10,000 deposit as soon as we get back. Mr. Sharp doesn't seem to be accused of anything at all, remarked Tom, reading the article for perhaps the tenth time. Oh, I guess I'm sort of a general all-around bad man who helped you burglars to escape with the booty, answered the balloonist with a laugh. I expect to be arrested along with you, too. But must we be arrested? inquired Tom anxiously. I don't like that idea at all. We haven't done anything. This is my plan, went on Mr. Sharp. We'll get back to Shopton as quickly as we can. We'll arrive at night so no one will see us, and leaving the airship in some secluded spot, we'll go to the police and explain matters. We can easily prove that we had nothing to do with the robbery. Why, we were all at home the night it happened. Mr. Swift, Mr. Jackson, and Mrs. Packard can testify to that. Yes, agreed Mr. Damon. I guess they can. Bless my bank book. But that seems a good plan. We'll follow it. Proceeding on the plan which they had decided was the best one. The red cloud was sent high into the air. So high up was it that at times it was above the clouds. Though this caused some little discomfort at first, especially to Mr. Damon, he soon became used to it, as did the others and it had the advantage of concealing them from the persons below who might be on the lookout. For we don't want to be shot at again, explained Mr. Sharp. It isn't altogether healthy and not very safe. If we keep high up, they can't see us, much less shoot at us. They'll take us for some big bird. Then, too, we can go faster. I suppose there will be another alarm sent out for those workers having sighted us, ventured Tom. Oh, yes. But those fellows were so excited, they may describe us as having horns, hooves, and a tail, and their story may not be believed. I'm not worrying about them. My chief concern is to drive the Red Cloud for all she is worth. I want to explain some things back there in Shopton. As if, repenting of the way it had misbehaved over the forest fire, the airship was now swinging along at a rapid rate. Seated in the cabin, the travelers would have really enjoyed the return trip had it not been for the accusation hanging over them. The weather was fine and clear, and as they skimmed along, now and then coming out of the clouds, they caught glimpses below them of the earth above which they were traveling. They had a general idea of their location from knowing the town where the paper had given them such astounding news, and it was easy to calculate their rate of progress. After running about a hundred miles or so at high speed, Mr. Sharp found it necessary to slow down the motor, as some of the new bearings were heating. Still, this gave them no alarm, as they were making good time. They came to a stop that night and calculated that by the next evening, or two at the latest, they would be back in Shopton. But they did not calculate on an accident. One of the cylinders on the big motor cracked as they started up next morning, and for some hours they had to hang in the air, suspended by the gas in the container while Mr. Sharp and Tom took out the damaged part and put in a spare one, the cylinders being cast separately. It was dusk when they finished, and too late to start up, so they remained about in the same place until the next day. Morning dawned with hot humidities, unusual at that time of the year, but partly accounted for by the fact they were still within the influence of the southern climate. With a whiz, the big propellers were set in motion, and with Tom at the wheel, the ship being about three miles in the air, to which height it had risen after the repairs were made, the journey was recommenced. 
"'It's cooler up here than down below,' remarked Tom, as he shifted the wheel and rudder a bit, in response to a gust of wind that heeled the craft over. "'Yes, I think we're going to have a storm,' remarked Mr. Sharp, eyeing the clouds with a professional air. "'We may run ahead of it or ride into it. We'll go down a bit toward night, when there's less danger of being shot.' So far on their return trip, they had not been low enough in the daytime to be in any danger from the persons who hoped to earn the five thousand dollar reward. The afternoon passed quickly, and it got dark early. There was a curious hum to the wind, and hearing it, Mr. Sharp began to go about the ship, seeing that everything was fast and taut. We're going to have a blow, he remarked, and a heavy one, too. We'll have to make everything snug, and be ready to go up or down, as the case calls for. Up or down? inquired Mr. Damon. Yes, by rising we may escape the blow, or by going below the strata of agitated air we may escape it. How about rain? Well, you can get above rain, but you can't get below it, with the law of gravitation working as it does at present. How's the gas generator, Tom? Seems to be all right, replied the young inventor, who had relinquished the wheel to the balloonist. They ate an early supper, and hardly had the dishes been put away, when from the west, where there was a low-flying bank of clouds, there came a mutter of thunder. A little later there was a dull red illumination amid the rolling masses of vapor. "'There's the storm, and she's heading right this way,' commented Mr. Sharp. "'Can't you avoid it?' asked Mr. Damon anxiously. "'I could, if I knew how high it was, but I guess we'll wait and see how it looks as we get closer. The airship was flying on, and the storm, driven by a mighty wind, was rushing to meet it. Already there was a sighing, moaning sound in the wire and wooden braces of the red cloud. Suddenly there came such a blast that it heeled the ship over on her side. Shift the equilibrium rudders, shouted Mr. Sharp to Tom, turning the wheel and various levers over to the lad. I'm going to get more speed out of the motor. Tom acted just in time, and after bobbing about like a cork on the water, the ship was righted and sent foraging ahead, under the influence of the propellers working at top speed. Nor was this any too much, for it needed all the power of the big engine to even partially overcome the force of the wind that was blowing right against the red cloud. Of course, they might have turned and flown before it, but they wanted to go north, not south. They wanted to face their accusers. Then, after the first fury of the blast had sped itself, there came a deluge of rain, following a dazzling glare of lightning and a bursting crash of thunder. In spite of the gale buffeting her, the airship was making good progress. The skill of Tom and the balloonist was never shown to better advantage. All around them the storm raged, but through it the craft kept on her way. Nothing could be seen but pelting sheets of water and swirling mist, yet onward the ship was driven. The thunder was deafening, and the lightning nearly blinded them until the electrics were switched on, flooding the cabin with radiance. Inside the car they were snug and dry, though the pitching of the craft was like that of a big liner in a trough of the ocean waves. "'Will she weather it, do you think?' called Mr. Damon in the ear of Mr. Sharp, shouting so as to be heard above the noise of the elements and hum of the motor. The balloonist nodded. She's a good ship, he answered proudly. Hardly had he spoken when there came a crash louder than any that had preceded, and the flash of rosy light that accompanied it seemed to set the whole heavens on fire. At the same time, there was a violent shock to the ship. We're hit, struck by lightning, yelled Tom. We're falling! cried Mr. Damon an instant later. Mr. Sharp looked at the elevation gauge. The hand was slowly swinging around. Down, down, dropped the red cloud. She was being roughly treated by the storm. I'm afraid we're wrecked, said the balloonist in a low voice, scarcely audible above the roar of the tempest. Following the great crash had come a comparatively light bombardment from the sky artillery. Use the gliding rudder, Tom, called Mr. Sharp a moment later. We may fall but we'll land as easily as possible. The wind, the rain, the lightning, and thunder continued. Down, down, sank the ship. Its fall was somewhat checked by the rudder. Tom swung into place, and by setting the planes at a different angle. The motor had been stopped, 
and the propellers no longer revolved. In the confusion and darkness it was not safe to run ahead, with the danger of colliding with unseen objects on the earth. They tried to peer from the windows, but could see nothing. A moment later, as they stared at each other with fear in their eyes, there came a shock. The ship trembled from end to end. We've landed, cried Tom, as he yanked back on the levers. The airship came to a stop. Now to see where we are, said Mr. Sharp grimly, and how badly we are wrecked. End of chapter